Now, where we are with these, with these ideas, what do they mean at this point? What could we imagine coming up next? What part do they play in cultural and intellectual history? And they do this in part because intellectual fashions come and go. Practical fashions come and go. All of the great ideas about how organizations should function of even 20 years ago, you almost don't hear about them today. Most intellectual theories are dead within 20, 30 years. Now, social construction, the sort of basic ideas, grew up in basically the children of the 70s and 80s. And that's, that's when the major ferment really took place. But in some sense, the focus on those ideas in themselves, you can begin to see waning as an intellectual challenge. So then what happens? Where are we at that point? I don't think the ideas themselves are, are, are dead, and certainly, I, in some sense, I don't think they will die that easily. Indeed, I was really happy. Um, just before I came, the third edition of Invitation to Social Construction just came out with Sage uh, in London, so it was really nice. That's the third edition, and uh, they're very optimistic about that book. So the, the ideas are still there. <coughs> But again, things move. So how to tell that story? Now, let me give you a little bit of a, a preview of what I want to do here. What I'd like to do is to propose that constructionist ideas and practices really are part of a much larger shift in cultural perspective. And they're part of a shift from, you might say, 300 years of, of what you might call mindset to something else. And that's the something else that we haven't been able to articulate. And I want to try to articulate that and where these ideas fit within that movement. Now, as I say, this is um, it's an invitation to a conversation. Uh, this is not a course written in stone. It's like trying to work through these, trying to gain some idea. Can we grasp where we are and where we're going? And can you help? And what's missing? What, how else could we see it? What would be the implication? And so at the end, I'm going to invite us into tables to talk about, about these things. Now, I've got to apologize, because this is primarily a Western story. different perspective in Asia, for those of you who are from Asia. It's not an Arab story, for those of you who, who have that background, or Iranian background. It's primarily a Western story, although it has implications for and reverberations around the world. But I do apologize for that. Let, let's begin back with what we'll call cultural and intellectual modernism, going back several hundred years. And what were the assumptions there and how the ways of life that grew up since around 15, 1600 up to the 20th century? And you've got several guiding assumptions. One that really goes back to Aristotle, and that is that the world is made up of elements or things. It's atomistic in the sense that it's just common sense for us to say, if I ask you to give me, a, to talk about a room here, to describe it, you'll talk about individual persons, the chairs, the uh, video, the microphone, the tables, and so on. Almost an inventory, but that's an inventory in terms of atoms, that is individual isolated things. You start there. It's a world of things. And those things have some stability. That is, there to be a thing is almost at the same time to say there is stability, because if it weren't stable, it would be difficult to say thingness. It would just be moving. You couldn't grasp it. 
So to be an animistic world is also to be a world of some stability. And that more or less this is going to be pretty stable for most of our lifetime. And we even have this conception that each other is stable with a basic personality, for example, which is just there, or genetic makeup, which is simply there for a lifetime. So some stability. Now, when you add in a kind of Cartesian notion that the world is also rational, and that there should be a rationality, this is not just accidental that all these things are here, that they have a relationship with each other, so that you could begin to predict, so that I could predict that if uh, I sit on this seat, it will remain solid. And that if I bring a two-ton uh, piece object and put it on that seat, it will crush the chip. So there are causal relations among the, of these elements. And we can predict them. And that we can also begin to say then, why does that happen? But here we have predictability among the atoms, we need a theory that is a rational framework in which to place those observations. So we begin to speculate and to test those theories, and pretty soon as we talk about it, we've got knowledge of the, those relations among the atoms as a map of the world, a predictive, useful map of reality. Um, so go to the first uh, slide. Okay, so I'm going to call this complex, complex here. Uh, let's use the metaphor as often, often done of the machine. Just to give it, that's what ties them together and sort of uh, visually is a machine. A machine made up of parts. The parts are causally related. Um, they have, the machine works over time, you can predict, predict the relation among the parts, you have a theory of the mechanics, and you could have a map which will allow other people to make that machine in the same way. Well, mechanistic metaphor. <coughs> now we mean, it, in some sense, all of this just disappears into the background. Of course, there are individual units and causal relationships. I mean, what else would there be? And science has tried to give us a map, and it's a useful map. But now all that becomes part of a, a way of life. Let's go to the second slide. It, it, it's sort of built into the assumptions and wrapped into the assumptions are, are forms of life of which we're all pretty familiar with. Um, Okay, scientific truth, okay? We want to test those theories to end up with truth. And this, the whole science movement, and sort of, if you look at modernism as being several hundred years old, science becomes the apex of that movement in the 20th century. The kind of a sum, where the scientific way of looking at things becomes the dominant way, where the universities are primarily the money is in natural science, with social science next, and the humanities, whatever's left of them, become a very small piece of the pie because they don't predict anything. They're not particularly useful. So we do objective research, get time to, and the notion here, uh, we're going to come back to this infinite progress. Because if we keep testing the theories against the facts, the maps get better and better, and we can indeed, indeed predict virtually everything. As in psychology, the hope was that if we can study and know what the individual mind is like, we can, we can contribute to infinite well-being. Everyone will be happy, prosperous, grateful. Uh, the organization, you know, the organization is a rational system. We can study that system. Management science becomes the creation or the attempt to document what that system would be like and indeed how you could manage it as a machine. Mental health. 
something goes wrong with a person, let's diagnose, find the problem with the machine, what's wrong with the machine, and fix it, i.e. cure it. Um, education, well, what is education? But taking all that good knowledge about the real world, things that we really know about, and giving it to students, because you must know this. You must know this. Um, government is a system. Well, in the same way, society is chaotic. It's essential that you govern it in some way, that you have government to make sure it all goes well, that the road systems go well, the airlines go well, the tax system functions, and so on, education systems function, and albeit it's a democracy, at least for a lot of us, it's simply giving permission for those people to govern. And your voice after that may go unheard. Measurement, assessment, I mean this is all about predicting and controlling to make a better and better future, better and better life. So assessment of are we doing it? Is this working? becomes essential. Uh, whether it be assessment and education to make sure that every student is getting it, the knowledge, that the system of education is functioning, right? really essential that you know these things, that teachers are functioning, and therefore we need mass attempts to measure and make sure the whole system is functioning. Feedback, change the system if it's not functioning. Same with uh, any kind of um, initiative to change uh, policies in society. Is it functioning? How is it functioning? Let's assess it. Same with the therapy. Can you document that the therapy is actually having an effect? I mean, it's just, of course we want to measure these things. Of course we want to have feedback on, is it working? I mean, it's just common sense, isn't it? And this is all gets tied up with economic rationality, and I don't simply mean economics in the broad sense of money, I mean in terms of everyday life leading a life in which you ask yourself every day, what am I doing? Is it having any kind of effect? Is, am I gaining from it? Is anybody gaining from it? How good is my teaching? How good is my consulting? How good is my therapy? It's like asking even in your spare time, what am I getting from this? I mean, you don't go running just because it's fun. Usually you go running because it's healthy. You start eating because it's healthy, not because you enjoy it, because it's healthy. You want a, a, a payoff from it, a product from it, an outcome from it, and conceivably you could measure it, getting on the scales every morning, looking at your cholesterol count. So that life becomes a matter of, well, this produces that, and it's a that which I'm producing which is the important thing, and it can be measured. And our life is just tied up with this. How can we measure what it is we're doing and is it making us, is there an outcome from it? And God forbid I should just lie around and do nothing. I mean, it's almost the worst sin of modernism, is just do nothing. And I don't know about you, but I mean, I'm caught up in this as well. It's hard for me. I, you take, I mean, Going to the beach is sort of my idea of hell. <laughs> I mean, just lying there, there's nothing to do. So you go walking, because at least that's healthy. We bought a hammock once. It's never been used. We put it up, you know, four summers running, and it just started rotting. Because nobody lay in a hammock. Because that's just not our life. You're not producing day and night. It's like, what else is there to do? And I look at that all as, I mean, we're, we're part of it. We're caught up in it. Okay. Now we're also so aware that so much of this is a problem for us. That we're caught up in organizations which do not, from our sort of welfare point of view, function very well. They're oppressive, difficult. The measurements, oppressive, difficult. The grand plans never quite work out. Things don't go well. You have to have more police. You have to have more ways of making sure everybody is doing the right thing. 
and so on. It, it's like we kind of, uh, in some ways, got up to here with modernism in terms of living our lives. Now, it's at this point that you get what, this is sort of the second chapter, this kind of postmodern move in the latter half of the 20th century. Uh, let's go back to the first slide. Where social construction picks up is in a set of dialogues that were largely, as I say, 70, 80, 90s dialogues, which were largely intellectual, but you could find basis within, within the culture. No, nothing that happens in intellectual life is cut away from the culture. All that attack, however, all that attack, that critique, was really a knowledge is map. That was where the problem was, where the intellectuals. Because that was supposed to be a neutral, value-free map of the world the way it is, which everybody could agree to, everybody should agree to, because that's knowledge everybody should be educated into. And the critiques were, you know, large, I mean, this is in so many books, just that, that knowledge is not value-free. This is the critical movement from Marx to feminism and so on. It's value-saturated. Every statement out of our mouth about the nature of the world comes with ideology somewhere implicit in it, with an underlying sense of what ought to be, not what is the case, but what ought to be. Now science becomes part of ideology. Um, secondly, that whatever we say in science is, we cannot escape our languages. That the languages become that which we must use regardless of the way the world is. So that we have a language with nouns, that is naming things or pronouns, persons, and if you describe the room, you will use those nouns because that's all you've got. Mm -hmm. Not because it is the way the world is, but because that's the language and it will strangulate you and control you. That's the whole linguistic literary critique. And the third one came out of philosophy of, you know, history of science, sociology of knowledge, uh, social studies of science, which has been a main, main argument for social constructionists, and that is that Whatever we take to be true, whatever we take to be knowledge and reason, comes out of groups who are collaborating together to make it so. That is, these are communities, scientific departments of knowledge, like right, communities, each with their own language that they speak, each with the things they try to do with that language. Uh, not because the languages are true, but because that's the languages they share, and that's what they do with it. <coughs> and there are values attached to that, every one of those languages. It's something they're trying to do because to them it's valuable. But now, if you crawl into that space of knowledge is not a map, then the rest of this begins to kind of crumble. And because you say, if knowledge is not a map, if we're constructing that in small groups of people, then the, the universe is not necessarily atomistic. It's not necessarily made up of things. That's debatable. Whatever we call the thing, we could call it something else. And we could not even look at it as a thing. So everything, the, the whole atomistic worldview then becomes subject to, I'm not so sure about that. We might be able to reconstruct that. If that's the case, then causality becomes a problem. Causality is not a necessary way that things are. Causality is a construction. Take it or leave it. It's optional. We don't have to look at our relations as causal. I cause you through my language to do what you're doing. What kind of, what kind of con conception is that? 
that we hit each other like billiard balls, where there are the powerful and the weak, and the powerful just hit each other, and then you move as a cause-effect relationship. Why do we stop that? Why predictability? Why is that the central aim of what we're doing? Why is my knowledge of you knowledge when I can predict who you are and what you're going to do? Who are these people as social scientists looking down on the rest of us and saying, aha, I can watch you through one-way mirrors, I can measure you, I can predict you, people down there. What kind of relationship is that of the social sciences to the world? It's, it's hierarchical in which we have the knowledge and the people we study, the objects. Um, now we can give the knowledge to those who govern and have better governance, as in mental health. We govern the system of the, the, those who are wretched and we put them in categories and we then cure them. Why do we do all that? Who said that was true? Can we reconstruct it? I mean, all this sort of, is, you're familiar with this, is if you kind of live in this world. Right? I'm just trying to point out that once you, once you question, knowledge is mapped, the whole rest of the modernist set of assumptions begins to, to crumble. And you begin to ask, well, what about explanations? I didn't, I guess I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't, uh, yeah, I did I say. What about explanations? Well, okay, we understand each other largely uh, psychologically because the explanation of how we work or function has been traditionally something lies behind the eyeballs, namely the mental process. Why should we presume that? Why do we have to explain each other with mental process? Now, let me give you a footnote here. Once you assume that the world is atomistic, then everything that exists is composed of something smaller, or what's behind it. So if you take this bodily existence, it runs by something else which is smaller, which is made up of. Okay. So that you can find the mental behind the physical, you can find the neuro behind the mental, and eventually, as you move down the scale, you'll get the atoms and then subatomic particles in this continuous quest for the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest thing, which is infinite. But the invitation is always for an explanation, which is not the thing, which is something smaller or behind it, which makes it work. Now, uh, what we're going to question is, why do we have to have those kinds of explanations? Because the whole construction of the rest of it, I mean, all the rest of it is a construction. Why explain it? Why have a theory behind that which exists? Okay. Next chapter. Now, as I say, social constructionist theory largely came out of that whole postmodern movement. Where has that gone? Just in some sense, where has it gone intellectually? Well, in a lot of different directions. For some disciplines in the universities, constructionist ideas aren't talked about anymore because they're just part of the background. You don't, you don't have to fight through that. That's the beginning. A lot of cultural anthropology is like that. You just assume that whatever you write about another culture is from a Western perspective. Duh. And it's going to be carried Western values. Duh. I mean, it's like, yeah, okay, that's where we begin. It's just built in. There's another whole vast complex of people who talk very much like everybody in this room who are called social constructivists. Now that in some way, in many parts of the academic world, there isn't any difference between social construction and social constructivism. That's just a different way of talking about the same body of ideas. 
where it gets to be a little bit different is the constructivist will buy into more of a psychological way of looking at construction. That is, there's a tendency within constructivist, social constructivist, to look at the site of the, of the construction in the mental world. I construct psychologically. And again, there's a long tradition, but yeah, we, Western world is psychological in the sense of our explanations. Constructionism, and I tend to be fairly radical in this way, I tend to not want to, I want, I want to look at the mental as also construction. And so stay in the, in the linguistic relational dimension. So I don't get into the question of minds inside bodies. Um, but that we can come back to that if you want later. No, a lot hangs on it. Anyway, um, other reverberations, people who don't know much about constructionism at all, never heard the term or constructivism, it will come up, uh, come up in other ways, pluralism. Every time you hear that word, you've got a friend. <laughs> because they're admitting, hey, look, there are a lot of ways to look at this thing. <clears throat> different people, different groups, going to have any way. I mean, if you, if you honor pluralism, you're really kind of hip pocket of doing construction. All those people are right on your side. Indigenous studies, indigenous psychology, indigenous medicine, and so on, as they've come. It's the same thing. Well, maybe Western medicine, or maybe Western ways of life, or not everything. We better listen to some of the people who are indigenous, or like been around a long time, or have other traditions. It's kind of a pluralism. Hey, let's listen and honor other possibilities. And that's, you can find that in so many pockets. I mean, it's, it's just there, seeping through Western culture. For me personally, and at least in psychology, this has also meant this move to qualitative methods of research. Now, there are a lot of things you can say about this, but um, the, the critique has been of quantitative research, a kind of controlled, variable, systematic, causal, experimental, hypothesis testing research. And there's a long history of why we need to pay attention to quality. Uh, we're going back to at least the beginning of psychology in the late 1800s. But more happened with that. Got, there are other methods that got to be interesting and useful for different people, coming up in very small pockets. And what happened to qualitative? It got to be the umbrella term for a multiplicity. For example, you had discourse analysis. It wasn't exactly quantitative. It wasn't qualitative. It's a different kind of a thing. Action research. It's a kind of research, neither quantitative or qualitative. In the traditional sense, it's a different sort of phenomenon. Collaborative research practice, where you work with people to try to generate an understanding. I mean, these are coming from a variety of purposes, and qualitative has got to be the umbrella term for, you might say, pluralism. There are a lot of different ways to look at the world. And each method you begin to recognize carries with it its own language, its own values, its own constructions of the world in its terms. So within that group, you begin to realize, hey, look, there are a lot of different voices here with different things, different ways of looking at things, all possibly useful. Why not accept each other? And the result of that has been this kind of general loosening what counts as a method, and even whether it's a method. If you go and look at what's happened in qualitative research, and I'm talking about across the social sciences, you take Denson Lincoln's book on qualitative research practices or inquiry. That book went through, I think, four editions in 10 years, because the whole qualitative movement, just, it spawns creative ideas. Well, if there's no restrictions, 
If I'm not studying things for how they really are, and I've got to make sure I count it, 